So um, I think I'm gonna do just a, a, just explain a little bit about what we're gonna be doing today. Um, and then we'll sit for about 30 minutes and then uh, we'll have some introductions and I'll offer some perspectives on this concept that's um, often called right livelihood. But some people like to call it wise livelihood or noble livelihood. There are different words for describing, I think of as mindful livelihood. So, Sometimes I think the words right livelihood may lend themselves to a, a perspective that um, if you don't do it this way, it's gonna be horrible. There's a wrong livelihood. And I think um, perhaps today we can explore what it could be like to um, hold uh, this concept of livelihood, what we do for a living, what we do to support our survival and our thriving in our lives here on earth. Um, and for many of us, that means having a job, the main thing, supporting our um, needs of getting food, shelter, things like that. We look at that, um, that concept of livelihood, perhaps there's um, a field of practice that we can hold as many opportunities for, for inquiry, curiosity of how can we uh, create and sustain a way of living that is supportive of um, our values, including non-harming and also compassion. It's not always easy to figure out how to um, sustain ourselves in such a way that we may always feel like this is something that will never harm anyone that is completely aligned maybe with my values since um, our lives are so intricate actually, especially for so many of us um, maintaining our livelihoods include participating in capitalism. I don't mean to uh, get too political, but I will say that one feature of capitalism that I've noticed is that one, one industry is interconnected with another. So for instance, if I wanna go out and buy some clothes, you know, I can think about, I wanna shop at a store that is supportive of um, my values. For some of us, I mean, I, I know that people here are earning um, a living that supports them, a living wage. Maybe I know that people are have benefits or maybe we want to shop at a store like that. And then we find out later on that the clothes that are being made are perhaps being made by child labor. And you know, it could go on and on and on in terms of the intricacies of the supply chain along the way of something that was bought, all the history that went into creating that thing, for instance, um, livelihood sustained along the way, but also the harm that could have potentially been done along the way in the creation of that thing, or in the production, the supply. And so, I think that there is a potential there of where we can do the right thing. How can I live in a world where I really want to uh, live compassionately, mindfully, when there's so much going on that is intertwined with harm? And I think there is a way that we can hold those truths um, in a practical way and in a, in a way that is kind to ourselves and takes into consideration what's possible. So I wanted just to unpack that further after we sit. And uh, we'll have some introductions after we sit too. So, um, 
sit for about a half hour and I'll give some light guidance. Yes. <clears throat> Eileen, I just wanted to say that you're, you're, I, I can understand and hear everything you're saying, but there are moments when your voice gets kind of a little farther away and tinny. You haven't frozen completely. And I'm just letting you know if there is something on your end that you can do about it. You know, sometimes people have like two different Wi-Fi's. They can, I don't know. But if not, don't worry. It's 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 ten. It's OK, right? Angela, Johnny, are you guys? Yeah, it's just a little like it's not the best quality audio, but I, I think we heard everything you said, so. OK. Yeah. Might be out of our control. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know. I'll see what I can do in a little bit. So I invite us all to find a posture as well supportive of one's own bodily structure. I invite eyes closed and if for whatever reason eyes closed isn't particularly comfortable or turns into something that's very uncomfortable, please feel free to open them. Perhaps with a soft gaze in front of you on the floor or in your lap. Where is your attention at this time? Wherever it is, I invite you to gently place that awareness in the body. Starting at the top of one's head. Like water pouring into a glass. Allowing this gentle sweep of awareness to be simple and smooth and obstructed. It's gently acknowledging your own bodily presence. There's no wrong way to have a body, no wrong way to have this experience. Allowing your awareness to settle in at the feet.
I invite us all to find the attention to where our breath is in the body. Where is the breath most alive, most prominent in one's bodily experience at the moment? Perhaps we can allow the breath to be a soft anchor of awareness in this meditation period together. While acknowledging that, of course, other experiences arise and fall away alongside the breath. In this way, our meditation is not static. There is always movement. We have differing thoughts. We may have emotions, sensations. This way our practice is a way for us to explore what it's like to have some patience, understanding this movement our awareness, allowing the breath to be kind of a home base that we, whenever we remember to do so, maybe when we're, our attention is really spun out somewhere, we can remember to check into the breath, to come back over and over. The deepening element of balance, equanimity, um, maybe even concentration.
Perhaps there are moments where we notice tension or striving or pushing and pulling with our awareness. Those moments when we notice something like that is going on, those can be moments of opportunity. Perhaps we can bring an energy of softness or understanding. If we're not able to uh, quite release all tension, maybe there's a space where we can soften around it. We give ourselves room to be perhaps to give our awareness a break, creating some simplicity by just returning back to the breath. Not much to do, nowhere in particular to go, no role to fill. Noticing the breath as often as we can.
Sometimes our practice gives us many, many chances to get close to the moment. And what we find out changes quite a bit. We may discover different aspects of pleasant or unpleasant, maybe neutral, things we like or don't like, maybe expectations that we had, wishes for things to be different. So each moment gives us this uh, opportunity to give ourselves some space to allow what we notice, to give ourselves some simplicity. Whatever the moment is bringing, um, there's an opportunity to hang out with it. We don't necessarily need to uh, change it or make it be a certain way. Whatever is arising is part of our meditation as well. And the breath can steady us, can be a tool for balance. Particular feeling or thought process, the breath is there, there to come back to and to return to some steadiness, some stability.
Sometimes our practice shows us where there are spots that we keep coming back to. Maybe we keep noticing the same things over and over again. Maybe the same thoughts, the same tensions. So many chances looks like this. Whatever is, uh, whatever is there, whatever we notice, there's not such a way that acknowledges presence. Maybe there's room for kindness and patience. There's no wrong way to do this practice. Whatever we are aware of when we note, we acknowledge, that is our practice. And occasionally, whenever we remember to do so to steady us, we can acknowledge the breath again.
In the last couple of minutes of sitting together, I invite us all to um, maybe explore what it's like to release all effort. Where is it possible to simply abide within the body? Allowing the breath to be as it is. Accepting our own presence. Welcoming this steadiness, this openness. Thank you for your practice. So I invite us all to uh... To take turns, we don't have to do this and just some um, short little introductions, your name and what inspires you to be here. Um, I can start, some of this is a little, um, I often teach through Inset LA, Boston Meditation Center and San Francisco Dharma Collective. It's really wonderful to be here virtually again. Sometimes um, through Meditation Coalition in LA, you find me in different places. I'm normally in my apartment in Glendale, California, really close to LA, but today I'm in Oceanside in an Airbnb. I have a wedding to go to later. So trying to find the lighting and a good connection and thanks everybody for hanging in there. I'm not at home where I normally would be. Uh, so thanks everybody. Um, so yeah, if anybody would like to go next, I'm muting, uh, raising your hand, uh, chatting, uh, please do so. Sure. I'll go next. Uh, so I'm Angela and uh, I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, I, I, I often attend the morning sits with SF Dhamma Collective in the, on Saturday mornings, particularly. Um, I have a practice of Vipassana meditation, but we really don't uh, uh, go deeper into right livelihood or right speech or that kind of teaching it's more practice-based and uh, 
So um, I appreciate uh, learning more um, in terms of, it makes me think deeper of examining my life and the way I live my life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll say, uh, my name is Johnny. I'm in San Francisco. I don't have a job. Um, but I interact with a whole bunch of people who do. And I, uh, I think that's my job. And I don't know what else to say about that. I'm trying to, I, I try to do it in line with um, the Eightfold Path. So this, this um, conversation, discussion, event about right livelihood is, um, I'm really drawn to it and I'm very grateful. And I'm really happy to be with um, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, go next. Um, my name is Tia and I am not in San Francisco today. Okay. Did a house swap with a friend of mine who um, for the next three, Saturdays is going to be taking care of my mom so I can have a whole day off of like the work at the house and the work of the making money so that I have a place to have my mom in the house. Um, so I'm super thrilled that I woke up in time to see Dom's text because um, along with my entirely double scheduled life. I really wanted to be here as well as sleep in. So I got to do both this morning. And I am uh, always excited. Um, I, 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 when I say that, it feels like I'm excited to like apply everything I know I've, that I've ever learned about the Dharma to being alive. And that's, um, but really like there's some particularly juicy ones and like how the, um, like how Sila works is one of them and the Brahma Viharas are another one. Like how do we do that in the world? And so I, I really appreciate um, the practical, practical uses off the cushion stuff. And thank you. Thank you. Um, hey everyone, <clears throat> I'm Noam. I'm in San Francisco. And um, right livelihood is something that in my experience doesn't get talked about a lot, either in classes or in books. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was already excited to be here and just kind of hear your thoughts, Eileen, and, and that, you know, every when the, your other classes have always been so stimulating. And then just a little bit you said, and sort of connecting, it's not just our right livelihood, but how are we supporting others right livelihood with all the decisions we make every day. It can be overwhelming, but uh, a mindful livelihood. I like that. I like that rephrasing as mindful very much. So I'm looking forward to it and uh, happy to be here with this, this uh, group. So thanks everyone. Well, thank you everybody. So, um,
there really isn't a whole lot said about right livelihood in terms of the Buddhist teachings. There is a sutta, and when I say sutta, I don't know if the, um, the discourses, the teachings from um, the Buddha's life, from what is now probably called the Pali Canon, uh, where he describes right livelihood. And I want to uh, read a little bit uh, from it. The Anguttara Nikaya. And right livelihood is a rough translation of kind of wise livelihood. I like to think of it as mindful livelihood. And the Buddhist statements are kind of like about um, kind of avoiding business and weapons, um, human beings, uh, toxins like recreational drugs, poison, eating meat in the sense of when you know that meat is being prepared specifically for you to avoid that. So, and that's kind of not much more than that. So it can be challenging to, um, when exploring sila or wise conduct, we uh, explored in past weeks, um, the other kind of ethical factors of sila, of right speech, right action. Like where does right livelihood fit in for, for us, uh, 21st century, lay people or householders. And I think because right livelihood is so um, open to interpretation, there can be so many opportunities for, um, for exploring where paying attention to how we support our lives can also be in alignment with our practice. So our practice is not only our meditation practice, that's true. However, we sit not just for the benefit of ourselves individually, but for all beings. And so there is a, a place where our practice actually carries off the cushion. When we are kind of deepening our practice, when we're sitting in meditation of listening, I think meditation is a form of listening to really paying attention to the body, the breath, to where our awareness, where our attention is, where we are oftentimes challenged to kind of sit with thoughts that may be, may be um, challenging. Perhaps we um, come upon um, to be compassionate and we may find it's maybe diff hard to be kind to ourselves or kind of, um, this impulse to keep going no matter what without really paying attention to how we feel or maybe the opposite of I don't really want to do this so I'm not going to do it <laughs> so we all kinds of aspects of our personalities can arise within our meditation practice and so we are, I think meditation has a, gives us a real call to, uh, to look at things further, to be curious and reflective and to find uh, the creative spaces of where is there room here to notice, to be patient and understanding what's going to uh, support kind of this non-harming attitude that is really imbued throughout the teachings of the Buddha, right? And that includes ourselves. So I think of as right livelihood, this off the cushion practice is where can we be creative and practicing these kind of space, practicing in these spaces of non-harming? Where can we be mindful in supporting ourselves, our livelihood? 
And on one hand, I, supporting ourselves for many of us means um, having a job. That's pretty common. Not everyone has one. But for many of us, that's um, a way for us to secure our, our shelter, our food, our clothing. It's um, having a job. If we don't, other people more than most likely um, are involved in some type of work to support um, living. So it's like, on one level, there's what the Buddha is talking about, this kind of like, are we doing things to support our living that takes other people's lives away, literally? So I think it's safe to say that being a trained assassin, this is definitely not right livelihood. And then we get into kind of like the finer tells of that, of kind of like, what would it mean to be a bartender? Where is the space for military? Right? And so there are opportunities here for finding out like, is this right or is this something that because I'm in a job that I need to support myself, I actually can't just quit this. I think that kind of situation that so many of us may find ourselves feel is particularly a meaningful thing. It's helping me survive, but you know, how can I be in the space of mindful working? And so many of us, this is kind of like a mystery of like, well, I don't know. <laughs> what does that even mean? It's so broad. And I think being in the I don't know space is a wonderful space to be. When you don't know, this is where you can learn. And for so many of us, the Dharma um, is challenging us to kind of have this willingness to try this willingness to um, to experiment and to be humble like we don't know and it's okay not to know we can start small of what is the kind thing to do today? So in our interactions, like how do we show up to work? Quite literally, like how are we showing up in our interactions with people? This is where maybe our lessons of right speech or our practice in right, right speech can intertwine with right, right livelihood. What is our communication like? How are we uh, supporting people in the job that we do? Do we notice where we are short with people, where we are maybe not generous or not even generous, but just kind of like, I don't really want to do that. I, and knowing not really wanting to do that means making somebody's job harder, more difficult. So perhaps the, the answer for some of us when we're in a job that we think I don't really think it's doing much to improve the world. And maybe for some of us, we can have um, the space or I'm gonna, you know, the privilege to sometimes change jobs, which is a wonderful thing to have if we have the, uh, the space and the time and the choice to maybe change from being, doing something that we weren't so jazzed about or don't feel contributes much. And that's our own perspective of what that means. I've known people who say they, oh, I work in an office. What does that mean? Well, you know, it depends. At the very least, you're supporting other people's jobs, right? So many of our jobs are interconnected. If we are showing up in a way that makes other people's jobs easier, we're at least not causing more harm or more irritation or 
disappointments are making somebody's day harder because you're not doing your job. The other person has to pick up the slack in a way, right? So there's that. The kind of job that I have, I have a, I have a day job. I'm a librarian. I work in public libraries. And for many, many years, I was like, well, my right, I have right livelihood. That's great. Like I'm supporting people's uh, reading how people can come and read and learn whatever they want. There's no curriculum. People do not have to have a job or pay anything to be here. Um, I felt very almost self-satisfied. And there's a lot there that was, it definitely is a part of right livelihood. And there was another edge to my practice. Like there's always an opportunity to kind of, well, is that true to be curious? And of course, you know, if I was showing up and I myself wasn't particularly interested in listening to patrons reference questions, didn't really care what they were asking me, I can certainly show up to this building that had good intentions, but I myself wasn't very present. How, how right livelihood is that? What, what's that about if I'm not really able to show up for people? And as time has gone on, I've been a librarian for 20 years. In the last couple of years, I've been really interested in the institution of librarianship. Of, of what does it say when we buy certain materials? Are we supporting certain communities when we buy certain books or um, publications that are really are reflective of the authors from that community, but we ignore other communities' needs? What, how exactly are we supporting the differing groups, ethnic groups, um, age groups? What exactly are we supporting here? What are we telling people about their value if we don't have a particular offering for say teens or we're ignoring seniors or... So we can get deeper and deeper into what does right livelihood mean? And I'd like to kind of address that perhaps there can be a space where this may feel overwhelming, right? It's like, rather than, oh, there's so many opportunities to practice right livelihood. It's like, wow, there's so many opportunities to mess up. <laughs> That's kind of how I kind of hold it too, sometimes. But I think maybe these are the opportunities whenever it feels kind of almost scary of like, walking a tightrope of perhaps this is a space when we notice of the compassion and taking a, a breath, our mindfulness practice can kick in. Maybe if we remember to take a deep breath and realize that we are human, we're all human, we're all trying our best to a certain degree. You know, there's been times in my life where I felt like I'm not able to really make certain choices about my job or I didn't feel good about maybe the management or, or maybe even choices of how I was buying. That can be part of a right livelihood, what kind of consumer choices we're making to support ourselves. Literally, like where, what, where am I buying this food? Where is this food coming from? And I know I've been in spaces in my life where I was like, I can't think about another thing. So to kind of, you know, contemplate another juncture where this is maybe not the best choice or the choice that I think is the most supportive of a particular industry or not, or I can't think about that right now. It's really hard. And sometimes there's that pause of maybe right now it is. Maybe I'm going to buy from this particular store because it's down the street and it's easier for me. And right now things are very difficult and I'm not going to go across town to go to the store that I think maybe is more supportive of its employees. 
which sounds like a really hard choice and it is for some of us. It's like where and, and where are this, the spaces that we can give ourselves a break in those moments with the acknowledgement, it may not always be this way. That we may have more capacity later on to make different choices. that may be then the common that we do into in terms of the kind of industry it's a part of or how it's supporting us. Perhaps we can do that later when there's an opportunity. So I think there can be uh, this space and this acknowledgement where there's kind of this impermanence with what we're able to um, work with, with right livelihood. And this impermanence can definitely be our friend. Like right now I can't change, but maybe later on I can make a different choice. Now for me, that's been the case in certain jobs where I've been in a job that I really disliked that I didn't think that um, the management of that particular institution I was working for was really within right livelihood. I didn't think employees were treated well or certain customers weren't treated well. And I, didn't, I was like, I don't wanna be here, but I didn't have the privilege of moving right away. <laughs> I needed that job to support myself. And that's a real thing. So I, you know, I had to wait a few years. I would really reflect on it and, and use my practice as a way of really being honest with myself. Is this true? Do I need to be here? Can I just move? Like, no, I, I actually, you know, it's in a line. I'm not doing anything to harm people in terms of um, being a trained assassin, of course, not doing that. So I'm not doing something egregious. However, it's not what I think is maybe the fullest expression of how I want right livelihood to be. So kind of honest with, you know, continuing my meditation practice, being using my mindfulness practice to kind of find ways where I can be kind and show up to the people that I was taught, that I personally was after interacting with. And also being aware when conditions change and there was an opportunity for a different job. And that took several years. And I think sometimes we find ourselves in situations where it's like, right now I can't make these choices. Maybe I need this bartender job. Maybe I don't feel like it's right livelihood or maybe I'm not able to buy a certain, you know, brand of, you know, or certain kinds of foods or that I know are coming from a really, that are ethically sourced. I can't afford that. I think we need to be really mindful of, of what we're able to do and what we have the capacity for, and also to be creative in other ways. There's so many junctures of where we can um, contribute. So I'd like to kind of offer that as an alternative lens that whenever we are making these uh, choices to support life. And when I say support life, like in the Buddhist sense, not literally supporting, taking away the killing or the harming of beings, but also supporting the livelihood where people can feel um, uh, free, we're, we're not going to harm them, we're not contributing to harm. And also, whenever we are, we're able to, to contribute to spaces where there's patience, understanding and kindness, where we're supporting people's kind of nourishment to be who they are, as we are doing ourselves. As we sat here today, as we meditated, we're supporting our own livelihood in that way. This is the, this is a nourishing activity to sit in meditation, to sit in community. This is a supporting 
um, practice. This is uh, where self care as, a, as a, an actual practice of the Dharma and community care intertwine. We show up for ourselves and we show up for the community. There is no community without community. So we're supporting each other's livelihood in that sense. So perhaps we can flip what right livelihood rather than looking at like, these are all the ways I can mess up is rather, these are all the ways that I can contribute to a world that is fulfilling and can really support everyone's livelihood. Look at all the, the opportunities that I can do that. And that could be even on the phone, talking to somebody and they're doing their job. How can I show up and really be there without uh, being unnecessarily terse or not being communicative? There's so many different ways that we can show up. And inevitably, you know, these, these teachings are not uh, another report card. There's no one keeping, this, keeping score. It's kind of like, what are the ways that we can kind of wake up? Where, how can we be free? How can we uh, support other people's freedom and liberation? How can we lessen uh, the suffering in our lives and allow a more spacious movement around so much change that we just can't control. So in this sense, our, our right livelihood of the sense of where can we make a choice? Where can we um, be in community with others? I think that communities like this can be almost like actions of solidarity, like we're in support of each other's freedom and finding freedom. So I think in any particular sense that we can find some lightness, and I mean lightness as kind of um, unburdening ourselves from a, a potential sense of, if I'm not doing the right thing, this is terrible. <laughs> um, rather than whenever we catch ourselves in that moment, taking a breath and how can we turn, how can we turn the lens that this is kind of an alternative viewpoint. Where is the opportunity for freedom in how we work and how we consume, how we support other people's work we're not so separate from people. So I wanna thank everybody for, for being here, for showing up, for your patience with my technical glitches here in Oceanside, not my home and uh, my Airbnb. And we have some time for, uh, for your voices. If there are comments or experiences you'd like to share or questions, uh, we have a little bit of time and um, yeah, I'd like to open up the floor for that to unmute and raise your hand or to chat. Um, th I'm so thankful for your teaching. Uh, it was a really, uh, for me, a good reminder about sitting. When we sit, we're not just sitting for ourselves, but our sitting also is for the well-being of everyone. And I completely overlooked that all of the time, a lot of the time. So it was a very, very good reminder. And it feels very good for me to know also that my sitting is not just been just good for me, but it it's also beneficial for everyone else. It makes it so much richer for me. And so I, I'm thankful to, to, uh, to be reminded of that. Um, also, uh, libraries are one of my fa best, fav most favorite places, public libraries. 
<laughs> so I'm, I'm very, very, uh, uh, it's lovely to know that you work there and I, I'm literally at the library every day, every other day. Uh, I make friends there and uh, we have a public, a really amazing library system in, in Edmonton. And, um, and, we, and we have a maker space and a kitchen now and there they teach cooking. It's, it's, it's such an awesome space. So yeah, it's positive, very positive, life-giving, uh, serving the community kind of space. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Somewhere back there, that might have been 15 years ago. I, um, I one of the one of the things that became super important to me was the idea that it it like like really combating the idea of that going to work might suck. Like that 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 everyone deserves going to work and having a pleasant day. Like, like even if your job isn't the most awesome of whatever, like it, it shouldn't suck. You should be able to go to work without having to like to get there and being there should be okay. And, and um, so there was a lot of, I, I work with my clients are businesses. So I work with a lot of businesses and it involved with my, um, any consulting that I'm doing with them is always like, how can it be okay for your people to be here? Like, are your people okay? And can we make them a little bit more okay? Can we make them a lot more okay? Um, and um, I, um, I've i been, these last three years, I've been managing a company of a friend of mine who has been ill and she and I have really compatible values in this, in this way. And she has some really, um, uh, important things that she puts into every meeting that she does. And we just lost our admin assistant who wanted to go back to the work she was doing before she came into to doing, uh, to working with us because we were, uh, the, her, the job changed and it was too much marketing. She's like, I just want to go back to doing administrative stuff. So she went back to law. And so she's back in a, in a, law setting and and I'm like so how is that and she's like you know what I'm bringing all this stuff that I learned into this environment so that it can be a little more pleasant <laughs> I was just like oh, yay <laughs> it's working <laughs> like, and she, and to even um she's still helping us with some stuff so I meet with her like weekly and for like an hour and just to hear like how the how just her as the new employee, like saying thank you, telling people she appreciates them, just like bringing in pieces of the culture um, is having an impact, even just that she can see, has been fantastic for me. So I, I, you know, it matters, we matter. Definitely. And um, just thank you, because thinking, learning how to think about it more complexly helps me a lot. You're welcome. In its complexity, to think about it in its complexity. Right. Mm -hmm. I think in this way, right livelihood can be um a tool in and of itself it's kind of like a lens of how do we look through the lens of mindful livelihood uh, there's different words for it we don't even have to use the right livelihood words mindful livelihood wise livelihood it's all the same concept but maybe from different facets and we can look at it as okay what what does that mean today for instance this could be a day-to-day -day thing a lifetime thing of how do I look at how I'm showing up today? 
And maybe when we take the long view, we can see, oh, maybe this job isn't it, or maybe this job is it, or these are all the opportunities that I can bring to this arena of my life of uh, showing up in the way that I think is, is wise for myself and other people. So if there aren't any more thoughts or questions, I'd like to thank everybody for being here again. It's always lovely to be with you all. Um, thanks for all your patience and your understanding and your practice. <laughs>